Now, we live in an age of data. From our messages to our location, our search histories to our spending, we hand over much of our most private information to big tech companies for whom that data has become one of the most valuable commodities on earth. Now, because many of those companies are based in this country, Ireland has found itself at the centre of European debates about the regulation of privacy. Joining me this evening is Dr David Kenny, who is Associate Professor of Law at Trinity College Dublin. David, good evening. Thanks so much, Chris. It's fantastic to be back in Dingle. Thank you for joining us. Now, in recent months, the Irish Data Protection Commission found WhatsApp had breached European citizens' rights over the use of people's private data in the way that the app is used. Now, we wanted to fine them 30 to 50 million euros, but after much criticism from other European countries, that fine actually had to be increased to 225 million euros, the largest of its kind. What do you think that that case says about Ireland and Europe's approach to the regulation of privacy? I think it's really interesting because I think it shows the different levels at which the fight for privacy is going on and the centrality of the EU to that fight. So the way obviously that Europe views data is quite different from other countries around the world. We see the fight to protect privacy and to protect your data as really deeply fundamental, probably more so than any other place in the world at the moment. And so as such, Europe has rules that are pushing the limits of privacy against big tech in a way that's just not happening in other places. Tech regulation in, uh, elsewhere in the world focuses a lot on things like antitrust and competition. And this idea of data and privacy being at the heart of it is really embodied by the European Union. But because of the way that EU law works, the EU makes rules centrally, but then leads it to member states to enforce them. And because Ireland has all of the companies, we also get all of the enforcement burden. And as the EU looks to regulate even further, there's several very significant pieces of reforms and, and, and major legislation coming down from the EU shortly. Ireland will again be under huge pressure to be at the very forefront of regulating privacy for all of Europe and then really for all of the world because what Europe does in this context is so influential, being the only country really pushing this privacy agenda. But what's really important to understand, I think, is that for the EU, it's not just about the laws that they apply to regulate tech companies, that privacy and your ownership and control of your data goes all the way down. It's not just a legal principle, it's not just a set of rules. It is a fundamental right. It's in the EU Charter of Rights, and it's perhaps the most influential of the rights in the EU Charter at the moment. There's two articles talking about your privacy and your data. And almost all of what we see in terms of GDPR and other privacy measures that people will be aware of stem from those fundamental rights provisions. So for the EU, it's not simply a policy position. It is a rights position. And because of that, there's an interesting clash. Privacy is hugely important. We all need to be really aware of it. And probably as individuals, we're not fully aware of all the ways we give away our data, of what we're consenting to when we all click agree whenever the app asks us. But at the same time, there are other interests as well. Contrary to privacy, you need some public access to information. We know that transparency is really important. We know needing to have information public so people can understand various processes is crucial. And we also, as we've seen recently, need data for combating crime and all sorts of other things that the state gets involved in. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things we're going to have to figure out in the coming years is how do we balance that right-centric concern for privacy and for data that the EU is very much committed to ideologically with these other really important interests? And how will the EU deal with that balance? Because again, a, a funny thing about the European Union is that it is overwhelmingly powerful in the areas that it has competence in, but it doesn't have competence in all aspects of our lives. It's a limited legal body. It can only act in the ways that it's been given powers in its founding treaties. And so there are some things the EU can have blind spots to because it's not the kind of thing the EU does. And as we see privacy and data butt up against those, 
there could be scope for some really mm -hmm. important but also really controversial clashes between different ideologies and different values. Indeed, and of course, there is a bit of a dichotomy here in the sense that, like, um, you know, Ireland's economic strategy has focused on getting a lot of tech companies to locate here, and then we have become responsible for regulating them for the rest of the EU. So there is, a, in many ways, a, a difficulty for Ireland in the way that we have put ourselves in a kind of a contradictory position. But you mentioned two very interesting cases there that actually, again, Ireland has been at the centre of in terms of the development of European law around GDPR. Mm -hmm. One of them is the most, uh, probably the most controversial case uh, in recent times around this issue, which is focused on the appeal of Mr. Graham Dwyer against his 2015 conviction for the murder of Elaine O'Hara. Now, the prosecution in that case made extensive use of mobile phone location data uh, in their case in the conviction. And a recent opinion from an advocate general of the European Court of Justice has indicated that the Irish state's way of collecting and using that data may have been in breach of European law. Could you tell us a little bit about that case and the implications that it might have? Yeah, it's a hugely important case and it will have massive implications not only for Ireland but I think for really the whole of Europe in terms of the way we go about combating crime. So at the centre of this case is Ireland's retention regime which we put in place in a, in a Communications Act about a decade ago. And what that act allowed was for the retention of non-content data, as it's called, from mobile phones for two years, which means that your service provider was obliged by law to store two years worth of location and traffic data. So where particular uh, things on your phone were done, pings off different masks and so on, and also who you were calling, who you were texting, but not the content of those calls and texts. That wasn't retained, but the other information was. And then in certain circumstances, senior guards could authorize access to this information in order to allow the investigation and potentially prosecution of serious crime. So that was what Ireland had done to try and, under EU law, allowably in EU law, access people's data to investigate crime. Now, there's been signs for some time that the EU might not be happy with Ireland's approach to this. The European Court of Justice has for some years now been giving indications that this kind of blanket retention of data might not be okay. Keeping everybody's location and traffic data, even if it's not content, might just be too indiscriminate. You need to start targeting the data that you are retaining. And also, Ireland's access measures in allowing senior guards to access the data or to authorise access to the data. That's not really enough for the European Union. They want an independent process, a very rigorous process for access to that data. So I think we've known for some time that there would be a challenge to this aspect of Ireland's regime and that it would be potentially very consequential. And what has happened in the Dwyer case is the European Court has heard this challenge, the idea that Ireland's retention regime is too broad, too indiscriminate, and EU law can't tolerate it. They haven't given their judgment yet. That would probably come in about January. But what happened recently was the Advocate General, just like a, a legal advisor to okay. the court, issues advisory opinions suggesting what the court's previous case law will make it do suggesting what the outcome should be. And they're very influential. In this case, I would suspect the Advocate General's opinion will be adopted by the court. Can't be sure. But that means that uh, uh, Ireland is in some trouble with our retention regime. The Advocate General suggested that it's simply not good enough. We're generally and indiscriminately storing too much data, that this time limit of two years, which we hope might help justify this measure, wasn't enough of a limitation. We're still storing too much. And that what we need to do is target particular people for storage of data if we want to combat crime. Now, what Ireland had said is that we're allowed to store data for national security. And we said, well, look, catching people who might have committed murders using you know, data on their phones, that's national security in some ways to us. And the Advocate General said, no, that's, that's not good enough. National security means terrorism, means threat to the nation itself. Doesn't mean individual crimes. Individual crimes don't really cut it in that respect. And so basically what the Advocate General is suggesting is that we can't store data this way, that we have to target it in some much more specific way. And as we probably all knew, we have to have a much more rigorous independent review process yes. for accessing it. I mean, it seems that's a major flaw that we had in the sense that like keeping such enormous amounts of data and it just being accessible 
on the process of a, a senior guard saying so is not really the same as the way that you would need to get permission to search somebody's house or other things the way that we're normally used to people investigating certain types of crime. But leaving aside the processes and the, you know, the processes yeah. I suppose could be improved, there seems to be a principle underlying this which may be, is there a tension between Irish legal culture uh, or even common law culture now that Britain is out of the EU um, and the way that the EU views this fundamental right of privacy in the sense that they are saying, you know, it doesn't really matter if the public interest is to prosecute certain types of crime or to be able to do certain types of investigation, but it's, it's just not, the balance has to lie with the individual not being able to say that they knew where you were or I was or somebody else was two years ago on the off chance that we might have committed a crime. Yeah. Like, is that something that is, like, is there actually a tension here between the way that we view that in Ireland in our legal culture and the way that it's being viewed at European level. Absolutely. And I think that I suppose there's two really important things going on there. One is that Ireland is maybe a bit slower to embrace this privacy-oriented thinking because in our legal system, privacy rights were never really things that we acknowledge to a very great degree. The idea of this right of personal privacy related to information, it's not alien to our system. We do have some idea of it. But in European legal cultures, the idea of a privacy right that might protect even your image or your sort of dignity in yourself is a much more embedded part of, of some civil law legal cultures in Europe than it would be in our common law culture, which following the British tradition is quite different. But also, I think this clash is broader than just that, because lots of other countries supported our position in this case, France, Sweden, Germany, Poland, all said, we need to access data in order to combat crime. And if the data isn't there, if it isn't retained, we can't access it. No matter right? how good the process is, no matter how many safeguards there are, if it's not there, it doesn't matter, you can't get it. That's exactly right. So if the data isn't kept, there's no access to it. And so what Ireland and other countries were suggesting is we could really improve the process for accessing it, but we need it to be accessible. And the problem is, and this is illustrated by the Dwyer case and others, that you can't target people in advance for serious but not organised crime. You don't yeah. know who might be suspected of a crime or who might commit a crime. That's not something you can know in advance. So how can we say we need to retain Chris's data, but not David's data, if you don't know which of us yeah. is going to commit a serious crime. So now the I, idea of targeting is much, much harder, mm -hmm. perhaps, than you know you might initially think. You can't just say we need these person's phone records, but not these person's. And so that might make a serious dent in our efforts to combat crime with data like this. Yeah. Now, I suppose, uh, you know, in an age of state surveillance and big tech companies and so on, we really do need strong safeguards of our personal privacy and our data and the way that they might be used by the state or by mm -hmm. corporations. But it seems from the way that you're describing this that perhaps there might be unintended consequences for seeing privacy as a fundamental right, something that kind of can trump everything else. Yes. Are there concerns about the fact that when the GDPR was brought in, I mean, often uh, the point on tech regulation is that the, the technology is always many steps ahead of the legislation. Mm -hmm. It's always the unintended consequences consequences or the unforeseen consequences are way beyond the comprehension of people who are drafting legislation years before technology changes. Are, is there a possibility that the GDPR contains in it some sort of very unintended consequences by putting privacy at the heart of almost everything in public affairs? I think that that's definitely a risk. And in the first instance, that's what the countries that are worried about this crime issue are saying. They're saying, we need this data to, to combat crime. The EU has kind of said, we're not actually convinced of that. You need to show us if that's the case. We think you can target. We think you can do other things to combat crime. It's not just you need all this data all the time. So that's a, a factual question in some ways. Can we find ways to do this crime combating effectively mm -hmm. without this general retention of data? That's the first question of that. But as you've said, it actually goes much deeper than that because with things like GDPR, which everyone will have heard of because we've all been told that something might be a GDPR problem We're or something. We're constantly ticking boxes and making disclosures That's and it. giving our consent, which we don't really understand, yeah. And, and also we might be told that something can't be done because of GDPR and we don't really understand why. And there's a risk that the person telling you that doesn't really understand why either. Because GDPR is so broad and so significant, it basically places vast restrictions on how everyone and anyone handles data in any kind of systemic way. And it is so broad and it's so rights related that there is a risk, and this is a risk that has been even discussed within the European Court of Justice with certain advocates general commenting on this being a problem, 
that GDPR is so broad that nobody really can properly follow it, that we'll all end up breaching GDPR at some time or other. And if that's the case, as one Advocate General, Advocate General Bobbick, uh, said in, in a recent case, he said it'll become the most under-enforced piece of law in Europe. Because if we're all breaching GDPR almost all the time, if it's possible that gossiping in a pub constitutes a GDPR breach, then suddenly we'll realise that this is something that's too big to be taken seriously. We're all breaching it all the time, yeah. so who cares? And there is a sort of a paradox that if you try and control things too much, you can end up controlling them too little. Because if you claim to control every single conversation, every single piece of data passing back and forth, eventually people think your rules are a bit silly. Absolutely. As we, I mentioned earlier, you know, this is a multi-billion, billion, billion dollar industry as well, so there are significant vested interests in finding holes in some of this regulation or perhaps it not being taken as seriously. So we do need to be very careful of that. Mm. I mean, you mentioned there about this balance between the sort of right to information and the right to privacy that yeah. kind of can be a, a, an unintended consequence of talking about somebody's personal data. There's another case actually involving Ireland recently in the news that goes to the heart of one of that issue, one of those issues, which is to do with this idea of the right to be forgotten, mm. which is another part of the GDPR, where if you are able to make uh, an application to online search engines uh, saying that certain information about you that has become irrelevant or out of date should be removed from searches. Um, and this was recently done with regards to Mr. Sean Quinn and the Quinn family and hundreds of articles in the Irish press related to their activities around the time of the financial crash were removed from Google search engines. Mm. It seems that in that case, the balance between personal privacy and the public interest is maybe not as it was intended in the way that the GDPR was drawn up. Uh, am I correct in thinking that that might not have been the original intention? Well, that's certainly my view of it is that the, the balance, I think, is off. Whether or not it was intended is, is maybe a, a more difficult question because it's hard to know with a monolith like the EU yeah. what was actually intended with this. But the balance between transparency and privacy is something we're really struggling to strike. There's lots of places in GDPR that there's a current case ongoing about access to court records for journalists to help journalists report more effectively on what's happening in court. Hugely important principle. Publicity is the, the heart of justice in this sense. And it might be that the Dutch uh, authorities have violated GDPR in releasing this information in an attempt to make a court process transparent. And Again, some people within the Court of Justice, the Advocates General in, in, in that case, have sort of said this is going too far. We're getting to a point where we're shutting down transparency. And as you say, the right to be forgotten is a huge one. This is where you can, as you said, apply to have information not taken off the internet, but taken off the only way we practically access Find information, yeah. which is search engines, right? And as you said, the, the, the Quinn case is a really good example of this. This was uh, at Niall McPartland, uh, Sean Quinn's son-in-law, applied to delist lots of articles from the Irish Times claiming that they were sort of outdated or irrelevant to his current sort of life situation. But within those articles is hugely important information relating to huge events in Irish public life. And so there's two problems. One is, what have we given up by prioritizing privacy there in terms of saying those things are now very hard to find comparatively to any other information on the internet. And secondly, who's doing that balance? Because if we had had a broad public debate about this and we decided this is what should happen, we favor privacy, the articles come down. And if we had a public officer that we trusted their judgment of this question to do it, maybe we'd say that's okay. But what's happening in the right to be forgotten situation is Google decides. Applications are made to Google. Google has a process and quite remarkably, if Google decides to delist articles from the Irish Times, the Irish Times is told about that, but they can't appeal. Google's decision to delist is the decision. And we don't know very much about Google's processes. We know they look at these various terms like the information is inaccurate, inadequate, irrelevant, excessive. We don't know what those mean. Yeah. We don't know how Google are considering those terms. And we also don't know how they're balancing that in the public interest, how they're saying, well, this may be inaccurate in some technical way, but the public interest in this story is huge. Yeah. Google may be doing that, but it may not be. And so all we know is that this is going on. We're told from the, the, the applications that are made that it's really only about 5%, let's say, public figures applying for the right to be forgotten, that the overwhelming majority of applications are private citizens rather than public figures. 
But even in that 5%, we don't know exactly what's being lost, and we don't know what effect that has on our public culture. So again, there's something really laudable at the heart of that, a desire to protect your privacy, a desire not to have available forever inaccurate information about you. It's a great goal, but what are the costs is the first question. And the second question, who gets to decide the balance yeah. between those costs well, and I benefits? suppose if we're not happy with the idea that a senior guard can say, I want to know where David Kenny was two years ago, because I think he might have done something and I can find out from his mobile phone records. If, that, if we think that's inadequate, it seems somewhat also inadequate that somebody in Google who is not publicly accountable mm. and doesn't have to explain their actions can decide that hundreds of news stories mm. relating to an issue of major public interest within the last 10 years are no longer relevant. Um, so that does seem to be a, something of a dichotomy in the, the way that we are allowing people to process data. But it also does show, I suppose, the way that this this is a paradox, isn't it? Because we do have this balance to strike between the public interest and the personal privacy. And we have the state and we have companies involved on both sides. Yes. How do you think that as a public sphere, as a society and I suppose as a wider European society we can actually discuss those issues because a lot of these issues are not being decided as you say through public debate through political debates they're not major election issues they tend to be things that are decided through legislation and regulators decisions many of which as we've been discussing have unintended consequences and don't end up working the way that they were intended like how do we go forward in a way that means that rather than this just all sort of happening to us which is what a lot of tech and the way that our privacy is used often Often feels like you know that's why we all yeah. click yes right because it, we don't necessarily even understand what the alternative is or whether we're gonna be able to do what we want so how do we move forward in a way that we actually consider these issues like is there a way for us to do this or is the technology just too complex I really worry about how we're going to be able to grapple with that issue because you've pointed out two really important aspects of it. One is that these decisions are being made, first of all, at an EU level. And it's very difficult for the EU to take proper soundings of all its citizens and know what people feel. And in many ways, it has to make decisions somewhat in the dark about how they're going to be received. But then, to a certain extent, there are citizens of Europe all over the Union who are having their rights adjudicated in Dublin by our data protection commissioner who's responsible for looking after their data because it's on a server in, in, in Facebook, right, in Dublin. So there's huge questions there about this is being done at a European level, but also weirdly at a member state level and having effects across the European Union and maybe across the world. And how do we make that participative? How do we get people involved in discussions about how they want their privacy regulated? I really don't know. The second problem then is that we've seen in some ways, the shrinking of the state and the rising of the private company. And there's been a, a, several developments of this. Facebook's so-called Supreme Court that adjudicates on free speech issues on Facebook is one really interesting example. Google being this adjudicator of the right to be forgotten is another. And this is the gradual privatization of what would have been public powers. The idea that it used to be the job of some central governing body to make decisions like that. And the people were either accountable or were picked by accountable people. That there was some process which involved someone being elected, choosing someone for that job, or the people making those decisions being accountable in some democratic way. And Google and Facebook are obviously not democratically accountable, nor is Facebook Supreme Court, nor is whoever in Google yeah. makes these decisions. And we have to think about what the state looks like and what the administrative state looks like in a world where previously we kind of imagined that a civil servant somewhere would be deciding this. And maybe that was not transparent to many people, but we had some faith that was democratic and it was accountable in a broad sense. I don't know how we make that happen for tech companies. I don't know how we make that happen in this digital age where private actors are more and more accumulating that power. And to be fair, Google and Facebook and TikTok didn't decide to locate in Dublin because of the weather. You know, there's the, they came here because they thought that it was going to be advantageous for their business. So do you think that in many ways Ireland is possibly in possession of a bit of a poison chalice in the sense that as these issues become significantly more complex and throw up more and more paradoxes at legal and regulatory level, the fact that we are in charge in some large capacity means that we're going to have a lot more of an administrative burden and a regulatory burden that we don't necessarily have the, the, the capacity at the moment to handle. 
Absolutely. It kind of reminds you of the idea of the dog chasing the car and not knowing what to do when it catches up, right? So we, we wanted to be the tech hub of Europe and we succeeded remarkably in that. But the regulatory burden on the Data Protection Commissioner is already overwhelming. And there's more coming because the EU has this vision of a, a digital markets and digital services reforms, which are about these intermediary platforms most of whom have their European headquarters here. And we're going to have to have national regulators responsible for that, that are going to be the primary regulators of, of companies in, in those frameworks in some instances. I don't know how the Data Protection Commissioner could possibly take on that job, given it's already, I think, somewhat overwhelmed in terms of the volume and complexity of the case it has to hear. And I think it's doing a very good job in, in many respects with a, a huge workload. Do we have to set up new organisations? How much is that going to cost? Are we willing to resource that properly? Are we willing to put as many bodies as are necessary into that job? And in some ways, it's a mandate that comes down from the EU do this job, do it really well, and do it for all the citizens of Europe. But you figure it out, you set up the regulator, and you pay for it. It's a difficult situation for the Irish state. And with more and more tech regulation coming down, and no sign that the EU wants to centralise this, wants to leave it with the member states responsible for these companies, I think it's going to be more and more difficult to be a data regulator in Dublin yeah, in the coming of, years. Lots of logistical and principled issues, and I'll definitely think twice before the next time that I click uh, accept on one of those things on my phone. So thank you very much, David Kenny, for joining us this evening in Dingle. Pleasure.